Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this concurrent session, uh, which is a, a, a mixed bag from different components of our uh, institutions, starting with a paper from uh, University of Cape Town and then Northwest University and um, Western Cape and ending with another presentation from West MK. So as we start, uh, Megan and, uh, is going to talk to us about uh, service oriented chatbots at uh, the University of Cape Town. So off you go. I'm just checking that my slide looks okay. Yep, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Megan Bam, and I'm presenting on behalf of the academic advising team at UCT. Um, this presentation was developed and conceptualized by Dr. Deepthi Charita and Dr. Riyashna Sithuldeen and myself. Globally, national, globally and nationally, higher education institutions are required to be able to do more with less while serving a diverse audience requiring agility, responsiveness, and creativity. During COVID-19, communication was very problematic and there was a need for us to provide students and staff with the latest information within a quick time frame. And the central advising and referral system was developed, which we refer to as UCT Cares at the University of Cape Town. Now the University of Cape Town has an array of services that helps students and staff members navigate life at the institution. But it's not always easy to know who to contact when you're in need, particularly in a moment of distress. The UCT Academic Advising Project established the UCT Care Service, which was a central email help desk in 2020, and it was staffed by peer advisors. So it's um, a lot of students that had been uh, uh, teaching assistants, uh, tutors in, in various uh, faculties. And the help desk became the foundation from which to test other service options, such as the chatbot. However, we also quickly realized that there was certain issues that we had with, with manning the uh, email help desk. So one of, the issue, one of the things that we looked at was, how could we possibly use a chatbot? We realized that it became very costly and time consuming to handle queries by email. Um, it was also time consuming and prone to human error, because in a moment of, this, of crisis and distress, we found that students were sending multiple emails to various email inboxes, causing um, often having um, agents and faculties answering the same question numerous times, and the student getting information from various sources that may ne not necessarily have been the same information. Thanks to seed funding from the Oppenheimer Memorial Trust, we were able to explore the use of the chatbot. The replacement of the email help desk became an immediate priority, and we did extensive research into what type of chatbot we could use within our budgetary and human resource constraints. Additional uses for the bot became evident in providing real-time data about emerging issues reducing costs in terms of the number of peer advisors that we had or live agents that we had um, manning the chatbot and improving our overall service uh, and efficiency. As I mentioned before, the, K the CARES mailbox provided the platform for developing the chatbot because we had already garnered a significant amount of uh, frequently asked questions. In the literature and in our research, we realized that there are two main types of chatbots that are currently being used in academic settings. One is a service-oriented chatbot and the other is a teaching-oriented chatbot. So we chose to use a service-oriented chatbot because we wanted to provide a service to support students and staff. We harvested lots of other FAQs um, from various sources, including our stakeholders um, and our university websites, and as well as the existing database that we used during COVID-19. We had a soft launch of the chatbot in August 2021 via a UCT news article and the CARE social media platforms. And the reason for that was because 
we needed, uh, we still had time, we needed time to, to train the chatbots. And therefore we decided to use it for a very small, uh, a smaller audience. We did a scan of the best practice globally to get a sense of the perceived benefits of a chatbot. And we realized that it provided a convenient entry point into the UCT um, support ecosystem because it can be accessed at any time and it could be integrated into our existing uh, um, services. It also provides the possibility of providing the same level of service, service to all student inquiries, and it prove, improves the quality of student interactions. It also provides an avenue of support for students who are not familiar with the university or who do not want to speak to anyone because they don't know anybody or they don't know anyone at the university um, where they can go and ask for help. The other issue that we also realized that the, that the chatbot could be useful um, in is it, can, it could support the university's capacity to be proactive in anticipating student needs, and therefore it had a high potential to improve the overall student experience at UCT. In January 2020, we had a more targeted intervention where we sent out emails to all our students um, before admissions. And so you could see, sorry, we have load shedding. So can you still hear me? Yes, you may continue. Okay, thanks. So in January 2022, we then had our admissions office send students emails, those that are uh, first year students um, and students that were registering. So basically all our undergraduate students. Um, this is just a slide that compares the CARES mailbox and the CARES chatbot. The main difference between the two is that in the CARES mailbox, there was no live interaction with an, with an agent. And in our CARES chatbot, we have the, uh, students have access to a live agent um, between 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, during office hours, not weekends. And the possibility that we could use the information which was captured um, on the analytics dashboard. What was quite interesting is we could use our peer advisors experience of working on the mailbox and it was easily transferable to the chatbot. Connecting to the case chatbot could take place, can take place by scanning a QR code or by adding a chatbot number to WhatsApp and, type, and typing hi and then you get a drop down menu. Um, the following slides will provide an overview, overview of our initial findings. Um, first of all, the data was collected from the responses logged by advisors and from the analytics dashboard. These data sets were subsequently analyzed by Deputy Traditor, and the data set that we looked at was between August 2021 and May 2022. So how did the chatbot impact on improving the quality and efficiency in responding to student queries? We found that the chatbot can serve more students. We found that, um, as Francois mentioned earlier, is that there were volume of queries over time. So it, it's very cyclical. So you'd find that there's a higher volume of queries at the beginning of the academic year that we found this year, and lots of questions pertaining to registration and orientation. So the total number of users on the chatbot uh, thus far was 1,535 with a return rate of 39%. And the total messages exchanged on the platform has been 71,000. Uh, we also found that the chatbot can resolve queries in a much shorter time. And from August, 2021 to May, 2022, the average connection time to a chat to chat to a live agent was 20 minutes and 18 seconds. From August 2021 to May 2022, the time taken to log a query by peer advisors was three and a half days, from the time the query was logged to the date of the query. In terms of emerging hot topics, <clears throat> most recently it has been around registration and orientation and what's important about this slide is that by identifying the emerging R topics, we are, were able to feed this into senior management to supplement and share information that they could use within their units to sort of plan for the future and also to get a sense of what uh, students were finding important during critical uh, periods of the year. Our findings in terms of cost 
was that a chatbot is more economically feasible as opposed to having advisors manually handle a mailbox, mainly due, due to human error, um, and also because um, we are able to then space out our advisors during period, periods of high query volumes and not have as many advisors during times when there are low query volumes. The chatbot reduced the average cost per query by approximately 43%. A significant decrease in cost per query will be observed with increasing traffic to the chatbot. And it also allows us to be able to do proper planning in terms of shifts for agents. And it gives us an idea of, of when we need to get more human resources in and, and when not to. And we're also able to plan accordingly, accordingly and allocate shifts more equitably and in advance. This, is, this slide shows some of the questions or the language that the bot did not understand. So, uh, for example, I'll provide myself with one. Um, sorry, may I ask the meaning of prerequisites? So these are some of the questions that we in the background have to work with to try and get a sense of how best would the chatbot recognize uh, these kinds of questions and, and how best um, we are able to deal with it. Two other important elements as uh, in closing is that training of the bot is, is time intensive. So when we started off um, with the implementation of the bot, we had no idea that it would be um, how long it would take to train the bot, but it actually is a very time intensive process. The other issue is that overarching projects that are cross-cutting across the university requires an awareness of interconnectedness and how we share quality information. There needs to be a high level of collaboration between different departments and units and communication of initiatives with different stakeholders across the institution to get buy in. We need proper advertising and most, most importantly, dedicated funding. The outcomes and lessons learned from the first year of implementation of the chatbot at UCT will be used for further development and implementation of an advising chatbot at the institution, depending on funding. Thank you. Thank you. This is very interesting to, to see how quickly you were able to uh, in, uh, make this available to your students and you have uh, got plenty of time to answer many questions from the, um, the participants. So uh, participants can either uh, unmute themselves and talk or put their hand up or put the questions in the chat. There is some nice messages saying coming from uh, the members uh, who are uh, part of the, who, are, who listen to you saying that it would be great. Um, but Randir asks a um, question for the next stage of the project. But does the chatbot have capacity for questions which may be specific to an individual asking the question? Reshna, would you like to answer the question? <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks, Randir, for the question. So the answer to that is twofold. So the first is that when, when a user logs onto the bot, um, they do, in fact, have to give um, some of some details. So are they an undergrad? Are they a postgrad? And um, and uh, sometimes they, they, they're student number as well. So in some ways we can path. Uh, so we have different pathways for the students. We we started out with quite a lot of streaming, but realized um, quickly in the process that they uh, this this removed too much information from, from a, a particular pathway. So at the moment, we do have that. The second uh, part answer to that question is we have been having conversations about, for example, how do we integrate into our PeopleSoft system? So was a student puts in a, um, a student number, then they are able to actually access their own personalized information. So this is an ongoing, um, in a sense, stake, internal stakeholder engagement because People like ICTS, of course, have a lot of skin in the game uh, regarding the existing uh, platforms and infrastructure. And then there are privacy issues and access to UCT's um, backend uh, and all of that. So some of the 
technicalities of that I don't particularly understand, but that's certainly a conversation as where we would like to take this technology ultimately. Um, but we are finding other ways to grow the technology in, for example, working in the academic advising space uh, while we continue to engage um, these tech technical questions internally. Great, thanks, Riyashna. Yeah, I guess uh, it really explodes once you get into the user-specific uh, information, and there you also have to use a lot of judgment about what the chatbot should say, and uh, so it becomes a much bigger script then. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, maybe I could ask uh, uh, the technical side, um, how did you manage to integrate that so quickly into your system? You're muted. Okay, so it's not actually integrated into our system, Alan. So we actually we actually had an opportunity uh, even before we we went into the chatbot itself, and we worked with a WhatsApp platform, uh, and we created something called Destination UCT. That was a static. Uh, FAQ, just drop down, user menu, and that was a kind of a precursor to this. And so what we had when we went to the service provider, we, we again, this is the issue is how you can, it's very difficult to integrate with your back end um, technologies, but these things are integratable onto websites and onto social media quite easily. So that's probably our next step. So we've, I've been a little bit, um, hesitant about launching too big too quickly but i think that has to be the next step for us as megan pointed out the more users we get the more um cost effective this becomes so uh, that we sort of a 2.0 launch uh, is something we're looking at fairly soon for a while so uh, getting permission to put it onto the uct website and um, using things like facebook link you know and all the other kinds of um of platforms. We are also, as Francois was talking earlier today, uh, developing a prospective students menu as well. But it's just WhatsApp at the moment. Thank you. Are there any more questions that people might want to ask? I think the question, so, um, the question, yes. I'm, I'm sorry, it's Reginald uh, from UP. Um, the question that came in the previous, the first part of the presentation um, was whether we can use the chatbot to potentially reach out to students uh, before they get to uh, tertiary institutions where a specific kind of questions, let me say, because you said that it provides you with data pertaining questions that are being asked and when. So potentially you have, I think, one of the biggest bar in your, in your graph was uh, on how getting into U, um, UCT. So potentially that's information that uh, the metrics um, would uh, benefit from. But I think the question, if you were in the initial presentation was on how can we use this system or this this, um, this initiative to reach out and address those questions before they get on your site. Um, Megan, would you wanna take that one or, or would you like me to take it? I'll take it. Okay, um, so thanks, Reggie. So yes, so, uh, you know, the success of the, of the, of the bot largely lies in its, in its ability to answer the question that someone is asking in that moment really fast. Now, it's not always, it does, that doesn't always happen right at the beginning because it does require a fair bit of training. So the bot learns, right? So there's an artificial intelligence background there somewhere that I don't understand, but it learns as we go. So initially what we are doing, Reggie, is we are in, in collabor or in um, engagements at the moment with our admissions department who have a um, program that 
goes to the schools and uh, and where, where they get asked all the questions. So we're busy working with them to develop a set of questions around uh, FAQs, around what students actually ask. And then our plan is to also potentially go to schools and get uh, uh, some sets of questions out from the schools, particularly what we would, not the inner urban schools sort of around the University of Cape Town, but sort of some of the outer line areas. So we're, we have a, a, a sort of sketch of a plan at the moment for how to get that uh, information. But of course, you know, working with, with, with other institutions would be fantastic. Um, if, if institutions are interested in, in, in working on us with that, we welcome um, the collaboration. Thanks. Would you, would you therefore um, put it on the prospective page that you guys said are working on? I think it would be potentially for prospective students. Yes, it would be for prospective students. We we have a prospective web page at UCT, but you know it's it's not it, it doesn't learn and adapt and change. We can change. We can add Q and A's to this platform like that. Like it, there's less than a twenty four hour turnaround. Whereas with a web page, you've got to get to the web page developer and get them to you know and all of that. So and of course the bots learning all the time. So uh, we are kind of in a sense getting away from website technology here. And we, our plan is to focus a lot more on the, on the bot itself. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity, colleagues. Um, I'm going to speak on peer support during the pandemic and specifically on the three uh, peer programs that we have at, at the University of the Northwest. Just a short introduction. Um, I'm Sean Nell. I am the SI campus coordinator, as well as the SI coordinator across the three campuses of the Northwest University. And I'm also an academic advisor within the Center for Teaching and Learning at the university. Now, the objective of my presentation is, first of all, to determine to what extent the roles of the peer students as facilitators, tutors, and mentors have changed since the COVID pandemic by first looking at what the roles were before. Um, we, we went into the pandemic, then to establish what these peer support programs currently look like as we kind of move out of, out of um, COVID, and then to offer some recommendations on what these programs might look like, look like post-pandemic by specifically looking at um, our facilitator or SI leader end of semester uh, feedback questionnaires, our S SI attendees, the students that attended the sessions, and then lastly, and I think very important as well, the lecturer feedback on um, the SI and tutor programs that ran during the first semester of 2022 across the three campuses. Now, just uh, like I said, uh, specifically with NWU, um, the LPO programs involve trained senior students who provide primarily academic support to fellow students through um, three programs, supplementary instruction, tutoring, and mentoring. Now, although, those, although these programs differ quite a bit, um, uh, we they obviously all focus on student support, but some of them tend to be more student-centered as um, others are more lecturer-centered. And this obviously has an impact on not only on the way which the programs address support on campus, and the learning opportunities for students, but also the roles and responsibilities of our peer, um, are, whether it be facilitators, tutors, or mentors within these programs. Now, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, the traditional roles um, and duties of these tutors, facilitators, and mentors within our peer programs have, in some cases, become a bit blurred intertwined to the extent that it might be assumed that may be assumed that uh, there were very little to distinguish, for instance, between an SI facilitator, a tutor, and to a certain extent, what the mentors did. So it was uh, suggested by management that these program offerings be reconsidered and also uh, what they might end up looking like after we go out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, on, on the, pot, uh, on the uh, uh, various campuses, we obviously offer all three programs. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, SI has been implemented at the NWU from 2014. It's the longest running peer support program on campus. 
And last, uh, uh, last year, for the whole year across the three campuses, we appointed 774 SI leaders. In our tutoring program, um, although we had, uh, uh, here and there we had clusters of tutoring happening on campuses, but the official implementation of the tutor program actually only started in 2018. And last year we had 146 tutors, active tutors across the three campuses. As far as academic peer mentoring program is concerned, also officially implemented in 2018. And last year we had 70 mentors working across the three campuses. Now, just, I just quickly want to scan over um, the roles and responsibilities of these peer mentors to show what they originally were meant to do and how that has changed uh, uh, during COVID. Now, the SR leaders are senior students who have successfully completed uh, the specific module course that they are working in, and they utilize collaborative activities to ensure that peer-to-peer -peer interaction in small groups take place and that students learn from each other. Now, the object, objectives um, for the SR leaders was to help students integrate what they learn with how to learn it, to learn course, course concepts, master course content, prepare for tests and exams, and learn effective study skills. Now, this program specifically is student-centered, which means student-centered learning gives the students the opportunity to decide two things, what they want to learn and how they want to learn it. Now, the SI program is non-remedial, it's voluntary, it's scheduled regularly uh, every week, it is out of class, it is driven by students' needs, and this is very important, um, facilitated by peer leaders, um, they work in collaborative activities, peer-to-peer -peer interaction in small groups, and it focuses on high-risk modules or courses. Um, tutors. The tutor is a trained senior student, preferably a postgraduate student, um, who teaches subject-specific content using lecture design or lecture-approved worksheets, material, exercises, or scenarios. Um, tutorials are pedagogic tools used by the lecturer to enhance learning in smaller groups, and the tutoring is curriculum-driven. It addresses the need of the lecturer, not the student, the lecturer to further learning in group content or context. Then the objective, objectives of the tutors were to understand, uh, help students understand and learn new content, to apply content practically, and to complete assignments, to monitor student progress. Now, now the tutor program is very much uh, teacher-centered or lecture-centered, where the students put all of their focus on the teacher or tutor. The tutor talks or teaches and the students listen. During activity, students work alone and collaboration is usually discouraged. Tutorials are lectures, tools used to further learning in small groups, also focus on at-risk modules. Um, tutorials are structured outside of the classroom, same as the SI uh, sessions. Attendance is compulsory, very important, and students participate in lecture design activities as already mentioned. Now our mentor program, the mentor program, the mentors are academic peer mentors in, uh, they are senior students who transitioned successfully into tertiary ed education and they provide students with direction and guidance to do the same based on personal experience and best practices. Now the objectives of academic peer mentors uh, is to help students settle in and make new friends and connect um, to the NWU community to transition and adjust to university life in higher education, a firm beliefs that students can succeed at university, provide a safe space for students to share personal, social, and academic concerns, to increase students' level of motivation, self-directedness, and self-efficacy, and to promote academic success at university. Now, our mentors, very important, the mentors are um, focused mainly on academic and social integration of first-year students although they also um, go beyond and work with undergraduate students, but the main focus is on first year students. And they only provide peer teaching in mod modules or courses where either SI or tutoring is not available. Now, just to look at my um, uh, feedback specifically on uh, the questionnaires that we sent out to our SI leaders, 
Um, we had three questionnaires, one for the SI leaders or facilitators. At the end of the first semester, we had 159 responses. That is a 35% response rate of all SI leaders that actually facilitated. SI attendees, we had 679 responses. That's about a 21% response rate. And then we had the lecture um, uh, questionnaire where we had 102 responses, which is 64% of the total number of SI, um, uh, lectures that were involved in either SI or tutoring um, the past semester. Now, um, I'm quickly gonna move into some of the questions that we asked um, either the lecturers or the students or the um, leaders that were involved in the programs. Now, the first one, uh, we asked the lecturers, which functions have they assigned to the SI leaders or tutors? Now, you will see that, um, and this, this will show in the, in, the, in the data further on as well, um, the main focus of the SI sessions as well as the tutor sessions was to discuss and explain course content. In the second one, second highest one there was test and exam preparation, work on assignments, then frequently asked questions uh, from the students. This, these might have been academic or non-academic questions, but relating to the class or assignments that they had to do. And then um, a couple of other ones assisting lecturers in class preparation, um, addressing ITO Effendi related issues students might have, getting onto Zoom sessions or uh, submitting an assignment, um, assist and upload resources for the lecturer or for students, um, assist in um, uh, marking, invigilating, record uh, keeping of tests and exam outs. And obviously, most of these are not um, functions that we actually, as, as uh, CTL, assign to the SI leaders or the tutors. This does not make uh, uh, make part of their role or, or, or responsibilities, but this is what the lecturers actually um, uh, assign to some of the uh, uh, other tutors or, or facilitators. You see they also assist in setting up tests and exam papers and even assist in lecturing classes. Okay, now going to the student feedback, we also asked the students who attended these uh, sessions what was covered in specifically in the SI sessions? And you'll see, first of all, going through content and covered, uh, covered in class, test and exam preparation, working on assignment, and then administration. We also asked the same question for the SI leaders. What was the focus of your sessions? Again, you will see discuss and explain content, test and exam preparation, work through assignments. Very important here, support for to the students, and this might be Motiv motivating the students, encouraging the students. So this is more of a supportive role. Then we also had administration. And uh, again, the technical IT issues that students might have had with um, either getting into the Zoom sessions or what uh, giving feedback or uploading assignments on, on our LMS or whatever the case might be. But primarily the focus of the sessions was to discuss and explain content, uh, do preparation for tests and exams and work through assignments. Now, very interestingly, uh, when we set out, uh, sent out the questionnaires to the lecturers, we first of all gave them, uh, just to make sure that, that they understood what the difference was between lecturing, uh, tutoring and SI, we actually gave them uh, a definition of SI and the, the role of the SI and tutoring and the role of the tutor. And after they read through that, we asked them, do you know, now know what the difference is between, a SI, uh, between the SI and the tutoring programs? And interestingly enough, you will see that still after they read through it, uh, five, more, uh, more than 5% 5 of the lectures were still not sure what the difference was between these programs. Um, then we ask the, the lecturers, now that you have gone through the definitions, you know what the, the roles and the responsibilities of either a tutor or SI leader is, which one of these two programs would you prefer in your module? And interestingly enough, you'll see that more than 61% said they would prefer SI, 24.5% um, said they would prefer tutoring, and 14% said, just over 14% said, I would actually prefer to have both in the module or program. 
And then we ask the lecturers what, what uh, they must give us some reasons why they made this choice. Now for SI, for instance, they say they do not need another lesson. So they don't want a tutor, they don't want another lesson. They actually want someone to re-explain the concepts that they did, not that students did not understand in that week's class. Um, they also said that the SI uh, lended to connection, uh, the students were able to connect with the module content, but also with other students. Um, interestingly, they also said that students who have felt more comfortable um, approaching an SI than a tutor. Um, students are free to ask questions and to engage more than, into, uh, than within the tutorial sessions. And the mandatory aspect and the mini lecture some other uh, feedback says the SI supports students with learning strategies. It was informal. Students had the, uh, the, the, the opportunity to ask questions and to engage more than they did in tutorials. And SI also lent it, lent it more to bigger groups while tutoring was much more smaller groups and sometimes more one-on-one -on -one, um, interaction. Then we asked the lecturers who decided or, or, or uh, indicated that they would prefer tutoring. Why would they prefer tutoring instead of SI? They said that tutoring would massively benefit first-year students as scheduled classes cannot cover our law faculty where we uh, mainly have tutors at this stage, specifically on the first-year level. And within economy, tutors work through additional practice questions, and this has to do with more application. Um, they felt that the tutoring was smaller settings, students who struggled more needed a tutor, otherwise they could go to an SI session. But in, in general, they felt that both have a place on campus. Then student feedback, um, just an idea of what our um, year level of module look, looks like, the attendance. You'll see that most of our SI attendance is within the first year modules, almost 70% of our first year of, of our SI program modules covered is within the first year, uh, uh, second year and third year and very few uh, fourth year and postgraduate. Um, we asked the student, uh, students to indicate to us the attendees, how was the SI sessions conducted? And this is also very interesting. I think one of the uh, previous uh, presenters also mentioned the age of WhatsApp or the year of WhatsApp. And in our case, we also had WhatsApp as the main uh, means of conducting the SI session followed by Zoom, MS Teams, and then small, uh, small number of contact sessions as well. We asked the students in which platform would you prefer having SI sessions? And very interestingly, uh, WhatsApp did not feature as, as the most prominent. It was contact. They wanted contact, face-to-face, -face, uh, Zoom, and MS Teams. So if you look at the holistic picture, um, definitely more um, online, but more contact and less WhatsApp. We asked the students if they would recommend other students to attend SI and more than 96% said yes, they would recommend that their fellow classmates uh, also go to SI. We asked them why, again, similar to the comments that you already had, it developed skills to make, uh, uh, to take on my testing exams, engage more and uh, ability to ask questions. SI leaders are very friendly and it made studying much easier. Then student feedback, did you attend SI tutor both programs? You will see that most of them attended SI sessions, a very few uh, tutor sessions, and then some 28% uh, attended both SI sessions and tutor sessions in the same course. We then asked them, what was the, was the difference in the way these sessions were conducted? Uh, the SI sessions compared to the tutor sessions, and this was quite an eye-opener. 41% said they were totally different. Small differences, 27%, and um, they were exactly the same, 31%. So in general, almost 60% of the students said that they were very similar, um, the, the, uh, the content and the way in which the sessions were conducted. 
We then asked the students, if you had attended both SI and tutor session, sessions, which did you find mo most beneficial? And then 49% said SI sessions, both are equally beneficial, 44%, and then only 6% said that they would prefer, still prefer tutor sessions. Again, we asked them why they decided on this. Most of them, like I said, uh, said that it is equally beneficial, but those preferring SI said that it focused on the needs or, and what we wanted more clarity on. Um, the SI tried to explain in a more understandable way. SI was not limited to, to what the lecturer wanted the, the helper or the tutor to discuss with them. And then again, both more benef both beneficial, they both have benefits. Um, SI is again more approachable. SI sessions felt like extra practice of the work and I needed that. Um, the SI focused on what they struggled with and they tackled those problems. And SI sessions made us able to communicate, but tutorials are just like victory. Um, then how did you conduct sessions? We asked the SI, SI leaders, um, almost 45% used WhatsApp. Again, you will see Zoom. We have contact sessions and then MS Teams. We asked the leaders, why did they use WhatsApp? And uh, very interesting, they said, students were still struggling with data. Most of them were still at home. They preferred asking questions via WhatsApp. WhatsApp was used for quick questions and for fast assistance. Um, there were clashes, especially with the, the um, contact students that, that were back on campus. There were clashes with classes. It was difficult to find venues. And WhatsApp was easy for everyone, cheap, safe time, and it was reliable. Again, it was convenient. It was the most simple method to use. Again, hard to, to find free classes or venues. And um, students were not shy to ask questions on WhatsApp. We asked our SR leaders, given the option how would they prefer to conduct their SI sessions in the future? Um, more than 61% said they would prefer a blended means of contact and online. Um, only 15% said they would do it remotely, completely remotely or online. And then only 22% 20, said that they would prefer going back to a face-to-face -face setting. That, that is how it was before um, COVID-19, obviously, we only had contact or face-to-face -face sessions, but now almost 61% said um, that they would prefer a, a mixture of face-to-face -face and contact. Um, we asked the SI leaders, did you have weekly meetings with your lecturer discussing problems students encountered in class and what to focus on during your next SI session? And 52% said, they actually had um, contact with the lecturers, almost 47, well, above 47% said that they did not have any contact with the, with, with the lecturers in order to plan the next SI session. Now, quickly, the differences, and I'm still running out of time, so I'm quickly going to go through these. What we saw overlapping is that um, between the SI facilitators, the tutors, and the peer mentors, all three were. Uh, focusing on test and exam preparation. All three were working on assignments and all three were covering class content, but in various ways. Now, the possible reasons why the, these peer programs overlap, um, lectures making use of especially SI and tutoring are not knowledgeable on the differences. And we, this is evident in the, in the feedback that we received as well they did not know exactly what the differences were. So they would appoint either an SI and a tutor, and they ended up doing the same thing, especially due, I'm talking about COVID-19 now. Then um, SI has an 18-year footprint at the NWU, while tutoring and mentoring only uh, has, been, uh, has only been implemented for three and a half years now. So um, I think that um, a lot of the, the practices and the, um, of, the, of, the, of the program is still evident even after we uh, implemented um, tutoring and mentoring, specifically tutoring, a lot of the SI um, 
skills uh, footprint is also seen in the tutor, tutor uh, sessions. Then uh, specifically during COVID-19 lectures were absent, the interactions and contact with students were far less than before the pandemic. And it's still so in many cases today, far less content were covered by the lecturers. Uh, students had mostly had to do self-study. The SI leaders and the tutors were left to fill the void left by the lecturers absence or lack of contact sessions. And they ended up tutoring or teaching. There was not much support from lecturers in planning of SI tutor sessions and the platform used for peer students. Um, you will see that most of them uh, decided on WhatsApp was not conducive to specifically for SI for facilitation. So that was uh, the, some of the major issues that uh, had an influence. Then quickly the road ahead. The NWU has chosen a hybrid or high flex modalities going forward. This means that peer support programs will have to continue catering for both contact and online, online students, our open distance learning students. In future, we will not go back to only face-to-face -face or contact. Um, platforms used, if SI, specifically for SI, we will have to change to Zoom or MS Teams, which will benefit the interaction, the collaboration in group work. Um, lecture, lecturers should be knowledgeable on the differences between the student peer programs and should then decide on the best fit for their own students or their needs. Needs analysis needed to uh, needs analysis need to be done within each module of course to decide which one of these programs will suit the program and the lecturer and the students best. Then it was suggested a multi-role was suggested where we would have tutors and SI leaders one student fulfilling both the roles and then one thing going ahead there would definitely be a need um, to look at other modules not only at risk as um, both these programs that you currently have focus on at risk modules uh, primarily and how will we then support the other students that fall within modules that are not at, at risk. Colleagues that in uh, total is what I have to say about the feedback and um, the road going forward. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you, Sean. So um, you can put the questions in the chat or you can just start talking because I think it's quite okay to do that. Um, maybe I, if, if while people are thinking of questions, maybe I could ask a question about um, how important does a, a collaboration between the students uh, feature in the coming designs? Um, definitely, um, I know there is a drive from university, uh, as is with, with most universities in South Africa, to have the student voice. Um, and the, the feedback from the students involved as well. So definitely going out to, and these are peer support programs for students. So definitely um, there is, uh, the way forward will definitely feature some kind of needs analysis from the student side to hear what exactly do they need? Do they need um, a tutor to, to present the material again, to teach them or do they need more interaction with, with fellow students or do they need both? Um, my personal opinion is that they will definitely need both. I would, I'm not uh, recommending one or the other. I think both of them uh, would benefit students, um, but definitely for going forward, I know within our cur curriculum design and planning, this is also a very important issue at this stage to, to um, uh, have lectures decide and have student voice as well to decide within a certain module, what will the student support look like? Will it be in, in the form of tutoring? Will it be in the form of, of facilitation or maybe something else? Thank you. Are there any other questions that people might want to talk about? Any other institutions uh, having the same kind of uh, uh, programs, both tutoring and supplementary instruction?
I guess I guess um I, I do appreciate the this initiative. Why? Because it bridges that gap between the lecturers and the students and kind of supporting that um constant uh, interaction with respect to content that they are being uh, taught and um, maybe uh, people who know much more better or people who are quite already informed on how to go about understanding and studying because what I've seen is that um, students don't have that link or they don't have that thing that connects them to lecturers is just um, support on the other side and lecturing on the other side. There isn't anything that bridges that gap. So I do appreciate this. Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that we have to kind of look at at UP um, because uh, student advisors and peer advisors have been kind of looked upon as just supporting academic support only, whereas professors and lecturers are in their, in their own world. And to my, I'm like imagining, how are we going to have this? How are we going to get this work when there is no link? Because lecturer is doing something else. We are doing something else. We don't know whether the students are struggling because of understanding the concept or something else in relation to the content that is being facilitated to them. So that's just my input there. Thank you for the input. And um, uh, Lisa Smith from NNU says they also have both. So thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation on uh, how supporting students is becoming so important in the world that we live in today. So if you could unshare and we could go to the next um, presentation, uh, Benicia, with your making, your project making a difference. Thanks, Alan. I'm just waiting for him to unshare, <laughs> then I can share. There you go. Okay, uh, let me get to share my screen. And I want to share this um, and I'm putting it here. Can you see my screen? Excellent, thank you. Uh, may I go ahead? You may continue. Thank you, good morning colleagues. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, today I'm gonna to speak to you about a project making a difference. And it is something that is very close to my heart. And it's really based on, you know, meeting the students' basic needs so that we can help students to re be retained and to succeed uh, at UWC. A quickly an overview um, of what I'm going to discuss on the screen for you. Also, from the beginning, uh, we are, uh, it, the project is 10 years in existence, so we are celebrating that. And so we made a documentary of the project. And I have a little bit of snip snorts in between to show uh, what the students are saying, okay? But it's really um, about um, the fact that uh, after my PhD, the findings have shown that um, financial challenge is one of the overarching ones uh, together with all the different challenges, okay? But let's first give contextual background and I'm going to start the first clip. It's very short ones, but I think that will give a uh, background. There's no sound coming through. Uh, let me um let me um on the, on the right hand side there's the little um um volumes at the bottom on the tab yes you okay it. let me just minimize them first um and so that i can see that <laughs> okay let me stop sharing uh let me see where stop sharing 
um, I my screen. Okay, yeah. Stop sharing and then see where's the sound. Uh, let me see if I can see it full screen. Um, I don't see the sound. It's, when, when you hover your mouse at the bottom, where yeah. the, uh, the um, it shows how far you've gone with the um, video. On the one side, it has an arrow to start, and on the other side, it has the sound little uh, oh, yes. speaker. You're, yeah, you're right. Uh, let's see. Uh, but my um, the problem. Okay, yeah, it's it's here where the actual it's it's been hidden from my side. I'm, let me try and also up. Uh, no, if you, if you if you uh, if you uh, um, start the the um, PowerPoint to to show full screen, you will see the um, you can see the the speaker at the bottom when you put your cursor over it. Ah, yes, you're right. You're right. Let me see. So um, here we are. Now it's full up. Okay. Sorry for that. Let's start again. Is it better now? It's not. Not the sounds not coming through. Um, okay then. Nice. Um, it's. It, can you hear? Yeah. Is it better now? The pervasive impact of social rank through yes. the legit Okay. Operations Thanks. For people of color of the ability to dream of a better future. Maybe it started from the beginning. By removing. Ex excuse me? Was somebody saying something? I was saying maybe because we could only hear it when it was in the middle. So maybe start it from the beginning so that I okay. uh, just just click next to the play button. Yeah, then yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Pervasive impact of social rank through the legitimizing of oppression strip people of color of the ability to dream of a better future. Crippling the potential of a people by removing their basic human needs will either result in an implosion in despair or ignite the flames that you still take me. Okay, so that's just sort of introduction into the documentary, but also to, to, to give us some context. Um, and obviously, uh, we all know the history. Uh, and then after 1994, the new uh, government, we're all trying to um, provide access. And so uh, formal access uh, was provided and also financial access to the students um, through NUSFAS. However, NISFAS is not a loan anymore, and it changed from loans to bursaries uh, from um, 2018. And so they have a new rule, um, norm plus one. So students are being supported for the first three years or the first four years and an additional year. And after that, they don't support students anymore. And so the financial need of the students um, is growing. And we all know nationally, our throughput and completion rates are very low, especially for our African and colored students, because not only of apartheid, but they are, because of apartheid, having many different um, challenges, okay? So at, uh, at the end of my PhD, the findings have shown that students have up to 18 different challenges that they are experiencing. And so we are busy developing a model to see, um, for me, it's about success. We know now about the challenges. How can we help the students 
And one important factor for me is to try and meet the students' basic needs. And that's what the project is about, trying to meet the students' basic needs so that they can concentrate on the academic work. And therefore, my theoretical underpinnings for starting the project is based on Max Neves' human scale development theory, which is about dissatisfaction of fundamen fundamental human needs, which are interrelated and interactive. And human scale is based on the fact that the human development is about the quality of people's lives. And the quality is dependent on how people can satisfy their fundamental needs. It also connects with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But Magnix is, is arguing that needs are the same in all cultures all over the world. It is the satisfiers that are different. And human needs are satisfied through three different settings or contexts, the individual context, the social context, and the environmental context. And because my findings have shown that not having daily financial needs, despite receiving NISFAS, is one of the challenges that we can contribute to the fact why students are not succeeding. And so I started a project called Project Making a Difference in 2012. I literally speak to our different staff members in the faculty. I convince them to help me. And until today, some of the staff members are contributing from their own salaries to the project. But the project then evolved and become bigger. And so we also have fundraising events. And I also now have a set of dedicated sponsors that are donating yearly funds. The project is a registered NPO. We registered that in 2015. We started with eight students in 2012. And to date, we have supported over 600 students. Basic financial needs, food per month, living expenses, traveling to campus and back, course readers, stationery, and textbooks. Once we accept the student into the project, we support the student for, its, for the student's entire career uh, study. So it means, so when they start, whether it is first year, second year, third year, we will support the students each month with a fixed amount for the whole academic year. We have many, many success stories. So let's see here, just make sure that the sound is high. And so you can hear. Oh, what did I do now? My name is Rodney Williams, and I am part of the project making a difference. In fact, I was the very first recipient of project making a difference. The very first day that I went to Gaffney with regards to my situation is where I literally felt that my world was fully in God. Um, I, this is my second time at the university. About two years later, they told me that I will not be able to, they won't be able to find me for my study for the second time because I failed dismally. And I remember Dr. McGee, one of our lectures, our very first lectures, she told the students that um, if you have any issue, if you have any problem, whatever it may be, then come to my office. And that's when I decided I'm going to go. When I got into that office, I felt like I was going to be because what is something for someone it is not easy. My name is Sandal Manobo. I am doing a become accounting degree in Batella. I don't know for the this I started at the night. I'm very top of my game because I was 
We are busy developing a retention and throughput model because, uh, as I'm saying, the project is 10 years in existence. It's going strong, and we want to now extend the service and the support to other faculties as well. And I have a team, uh, Institute for Applied Alchemy. Um, they are focusing on NPOs and they are empowering NPOs. And this is the model that we're busy developing and see how we can then extend it to different to the different faculties. And that's how I'm also presenting it here. So if institutions are uh, interested to see what we're doing and how we did it, uh, I will leave my um, email address at the end. But it's about now knowing the factors and moving the students. So enabling provide in their basic needs, the daily basic needs, so that they can concentrate and that they can, uh, you know, be retained and then in the end succeed. We're working with the um, sustainable development goals of 2030 and, and we're focusing on, on alleviating poverty, hunger, um, health students, well being, because if they stress, if they don't have food, if they can't come to campus, um, it impacted on their health. And we want to provide uh, that good education experience so that they can focus, can succeed, and find decent work. Um, let's just look at the results now. Make sure it's on top there. How this, what the students are saying, how the students I are helping. I think making a different scale is a completely different thing to do to me of my life. I could have been working in a factory, project making a difference gave me a completely different role. Um, it started off with, you know, just traveling my campus, just buying food for my kids, by getting something for them for lunch for the next day. Um, project making a difference gave me a completely different outlook. Online. I wouldn't sit though for just just a matriki, just a person with a matric certificate behind my name. And then I was always had a love for uh, working with figures. So I decided and actually maths and accounting was one of my two of my stronger subjects on school level. So that's why I decided to involve my degree in financial accounting. And the goal is to become a CPA. But actually turn my whole perspective. I would change because I could not focus more on my studies and um, there was less worries about the situation at home, about my situation because with this project make a difference financial assistance, I could actually send some money home to change the situation at home. Because my, during my second year of studies, yeah, as a result of my results, actually, um, I was part of the Deeds Merit Award list as well and then also got invited. Um, to the goal to keep part of the goal to keep the national um on the society. I just want to go back because I I I skipped sorry sorry colleagues I skipped one um I skipped this one <laughs> Okay, but I 
guys could be your financial accountant. Now we know I started studying there was no one working in, in my house. So I decided to go and study and uh, I was struggling a bit financially. It was the only um, income that we had at home was uh, one of my mothers and she received us a grant from the government. So that actually made me go to prof and speak to her about my situation and then she informed me about the project make a difference. And she told me that I can come to them anytime, whenever I'm in need, and then she will assist me. My name is Simele Mendiamo, and I'm a student of the University of the West of the And the degree that I'm doing is Corporate Diploma in Management Finance, and I'm currently doing my second year level of it. It was first year. 2018, uh, I got to know about project make a difference So, uh, uh, as a child from my previous day, disadvantaged background, I was only sent to university, only a parent in the play could come and study. So, my hope for anything was I was to wait on LS first. So, when I came here, Prof made me an announcement in class that if there's any student that's, that is in need of anything, whether to age, for Sport, students should go to the uh, I was raised by a single mother, so uh, for me to go and speak to Dr. Mikey, when I saw her, she just reminded me of my mother. No student can survive without eating, so one of the mechanisms that makes me to be able to be a good student is when I'm able to have something to eat and not be able to, like, not to be worried about where my next meal is coming from. When I got the project and I started getting food, I saw myself healthy and I was always full and I didn't have to worry about food. Hence, I could socialize. Hence, I could meet new friends. Hence, I could even take my studies seriously because I remember my first two tests that I wrote before I got the project. It was a complete fail. And before that, I've never been a student, a student that had failed before. It, 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 it's, it makes me so emotional to know that there is someone in an institution such as UWC that cares for the well-being of students. For me, it, it gave me hope in humanity that there are still people out there that are willing to help disadvantaged students. An investment that is just made to students on the basis of them being hungry or not on the basis of them having to pay back. Such an emotional to say that a lot of students are being helped by the project. So in the end, as I'm saying, we supported 600 students to date. And um, just a little background. Um, so we help everyone who are, who's in need. We don't turn anyone uh, away. And uh, Sipi Lile now graduated of his BCom, and as he explained, he's busy with a postgraduate diploma. Matthew graduated, still performing top in his class, and he graduated now in April. And Rondalyn Williams, our very first student who wanted to drop out because she didn't have finances, she became the top performing student for two years, and she will be graduating now with her master's degree cum laude. Thank you. I'm just acknowledging the organization who is assisting us and who is also uh, getting more sponsors for us. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, this was uh, quite an uh, emotive uh, presentation. And it just shows when we care for our students, how we might be able to change their lives. So thank you very much for that uh, paper. Uh, Sue, you, would you like to say something? Uh, hi, Alan. No, I, I really enjoy that presentation and, and, I'm, and I'm actually quite excited when I see faculties at UWC, you know, aligning their projects to the institutional uh, student retention and success framework because uh, the one layer of our framework talks about uh, a caring 
UWC environment and uh, Venetia's project is actually located in that. So well done, it was really great to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments, discussions? Uh, wow, well, we're waiting. Maybe there's none. Uh, I'm just putting my email address in. So, um, as I'm saying, we are uh, planning to roll it out now to the other different faculties because we, I have secured, you know, sort of stable funding. We're also planning to um, appoint a person because I was doing this on a part-time basis in between all the stuff, but the demand for funding is really getting too big for me. So we're looking at appointing a dedicated person that can track the students, uh, that can help also with the peer support, with one-on-one, -on -one, with advising, that we can alert the lecturers if there's trouble, that we can appoint the extra tutor or something like that. So we are very excited and was the team of the applied uh, alchemy team, um, we're going to take it further. And maybe it could come a national thing of how other universities can also start something similar to help retention and throughput of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments? So thank you very much for this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it was uh, uh, ways in which we think about students is always very important. So thank you for bringing this to us. We will wait for five minutes and for the next paper. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, still morning. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, our presentation this morning is looking at the use of disaggregated data to identify opportunities, gaps, and barriers to first-year student success. Uh, we're looking specifically at just one project and how within this one project we can actually work as a team uh, in a very collaborative way and provide holistic support to look at this high-impact uh, practice uh, that we identified. Specifically, it's known as our high priority module. And the reason why we actually call it high priority module, uh, most of you would know the term uh, high impact module or at risk module or killer module, but we decided to take a more positive look on these two uh, modules that have a low pass rate and rather call them our high priority module giving priority to students and lecturers in that uh, module. So I'm gonna hand over to Vanessa to start the presentation, Vanessa. Uh, thank you, Sue, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, I think I'll uh, take the video off and we can go through the presentation now. Um, so I'm just going to speak for a few minutes uh, about the background to to um, what, what we are doing with the high priority modules. And it's important to note that in terms of the background, um, this work builds on, um, so you can uh, um, look at the next slide, or let me just quickly, yes, thank you. It looks uh, at work, the next slide, sorry, Sue, uh, that we did in a project called Operation Student Success, which was a major data analytics project we conducted a few years ago. We, we did a six year study of a particular cohort of students really wanting to highlight um, the outcomes for students in terms of year-on-year -year retention, completion and regulation time, delayed completion, attrition, looking at factors like stepping out, stepping back in, program switching, and other factors that um, impacted student outcomes. So we tried to look at when we're losing students, what was happening at that time, highlighting when and where students struggle. This uh, the code study was done overall as well as per program. And um, 
you know, identifying the things that put students at risk and identifying patterns, trends, and correlations. What I want to talk about here today is how the, the learnings and the findings out of this project impacted what we decided to do in terms of Suisia Pumalela. And really looking at those two areas in purple, we found particular trends of, around what was happening to first year students and what was happening to students who were in these modules that a lot of people were failing. The key finding from that was that UWC early failure leads to dropout. And you will see our Sia Pumalela work focuses on those first year students. Thank you, Sue. So this is one of the, the most important findings that we found. We really wanted to drill down to what goes on um, for first year students, it's not just in relation to students who drop out, but we studied students who drop out through the six year period and tried to look back on how um, the first year experience impacted that. And so um, what we what we did found what find was um, for example, that 31% of students who received what we then called a risk code in first year and continued with their studies, completed their studies. So only one third of those students we saw in first year, we looked at these codes that were when a student fails, when a student um, was not allowed to promote to the following year because they hadn't had um, achieved enough credits, but they were given special permission to do so. So all of those other codes um, may proceed, refused, but can register. Those three codes, the top three really were what we call risk codes. Um, there is a percentage of students who were excluded, and then there's also a percentage of students who walked away. But when we looked at the students who continued, despite um, having received these risk codes, we saw that they were struggling in later years. 47% of them dropped out in later years, and 22% were still struggling to complete the three-year degree after six years. So, um, and when we looked at who the students are who were dropping out, we, were, we saw that 80% of those students who we lost in later year, uh, who, we, who we lost, were actually dropped out in first year or received risk codes in first year. So that pointed indisputably to the fact that we needed to focus on what's happening with students in the first year. Um, the other thing that we also found was that uh, we saw a correlation between what we were calling most failed modules. In other words, for students who dropped out, which were the modules that most of them had failed. And then that brought us to understanding that those were the high priority modules. So as we've said, the high priority modules have pass rates less than 70%. Highest priority have pass rates between 70 and 79%. So those are the criteria I don't have time to go through all of them, but Sue, if you can take me quickly to the next slide. I'm sorry we're having to do this so quickly. So we're focusing on these high impact modules. I just want to say something briefly about what's happening to these high impact modules um, as a consequence of COVID. And so we've tried to show and we're studying the modules we've selected to look at um, as on part of the Sia Pumalela project. And you will see that the, the, the gold bar that you see predominantly higher than everything else is what happens to the modules um, during 2020, during the COVID pandemic, when there are um, allowances and accommodations being made and no exclusions and online assessment for the first time and um, all kinds of ways of giving students additional opportunities to succeed because of the impact um, of the, the pandemic. And so we see an escalation in these marks. Um, the dark blue um, bar is the marks, uh, pass rates in the modules coming back down into um, the 2021 year. So if you look at the, the light blue, that is 2019 um, pass rates in the high impact modules, the gold bars are what happens in 2020 during the pandemic when we have a new set of um, rules for how we deal with students to support them during the pandemic. And then in 2021, we start seeing some of these pass rates shifting back to what they were in 2019. But what we also see is um, the, the ground is kind of shifting around these pass rates. 
Um, and even in the institution, you'll see the small graph on the right hand side, uh, you, you'll see that in 2019, the average pass rates in all of our semester one assessments was almost 56%. It went up to 62 almost in 2020, and then starts coming back down to to closer levels in 2021, which is the year when we start returning to normal or um, uh, assessment rules and uh, progression rules and, and not the accommodations that were made during the pandemic. But um, if you just take me to the next slide, please. Um, so we want to be considering as we go forward again in terms of tracking what's going on in this module, the uh, Pumalela GWC a project one uh, identified 26 modules that we wanting to be looked at as high priority modules. We obviously use the 2019 data and we looked at the impact now of COVID-19 on that data. And the consequence at the end of 2021 is that six of the modules are no longer classified as high or highest priority. So they disappear off the list, right? Nine modules have improved significantly um, from highest priority to high priority modules. Six have increased, but still remained um, of concern. And um, five of the modules decreased um, some quite significantly, but the highest percentage increases we saw in these modules were quite huge percentages. For example, 16%, 18, you would have seen one module that went from 42% to 68%, but we also have we now have new high priority modules. So what this is alerting us to is that we will start having to disaggregate and look further and see what else is going on in terms of high priority modules in the in the post um, pandemic era. So I'll hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, as part of the Siapamela project uh, with the data analytics working group, we um, engage on a weekly or bi-weekly process in terms of looking at the data and trying to build the, um, the culture of evidence where we, all our meetings, we bring the data to the forefront because um, one of the aims of the data analytics working group is to advise and guide um, and also champion the analytics project. So what we do is um, advise in terms of what kind of data that we need to be collecting if we don't have, uh, what type of analysis that we can undertake to support uh, and make sure that we understand our student um, success outcomes, including also student performance, retention and throughput. And by doing this, we also try to identify gaps and also um, by do we, uh, we do this by disaggregating the data so that we are able to see the opportunities that lies within um, the data that we have as uh, in the uh, in the institution as well. Uh, but uh, building on what we do, we we always rely on the data discovery model that was built by um, the achieving the dream. And I think we need to appreciate the network that we have through Sia Pumelela, where we are exposed to some of these tools and frameworks that we can rely on in terms of how we do and process, um, how we do our work in our institution as well. So with this process, it, it helps us and guides us in, in what Vanessa has already alluded to, to determine what is wrong. So we, we were able to go into the data and take it, disaggregate it and look at what was wrong with um, uh, our module performances and all that. And also keep on asking questions. Why are these things are happening? What type of barriers and uh, factors can we identify from this, um, uh, uh, from what we see in the data as well? And all these discussions helps us as well to create interventions. And I think Sue later on is going to explain in terms of the processes, all the things that we are trying to achieve at UWC in terms of the interventions that we want to implement in support of making sure that we, um, we address the barriers. And also, I think the model also helps us that in year three of the Siapumela project, that is where we want to go back and assess and monitor and um, 
and modify some of the intervention and maybe probably collect the data and, and make sure that we analyze that information and find out and ask ourselves questions relating to whether the interventions that we have implemented through um, the process in our year two now, are they working, are they effective? Um, and also, can we improve on those interventions or can we scale them up as well? But part of everything else that we do as well in this year, Pumerela, is the analytics process that we go through in, in, um, in the BI as well, where we try to understand the, pro the, the problem from the areas where they are highlighted in all these meetings that we go to, including the data analytics working group with all the recommendations and um, suggestions that they put forward, we go back and we try and, and because they also guide us and, and, and identify where the gaps are and identify the source of information where we can get um, data from. But I also need to make sure that I um, explain this as well. The data analytics group has um, the majority of specialist people or experts within the group, as well as the people who um, are the owners of the data. So it makes it easier for us to collect the data because they are able through the discussions and the conversations that we have to identify or also highlight that this kind of a data source exists in department X, we are able to access that information because they are party to those discussions as well. And from there, then we start doing the data wrangling and making sure that we apply the analytics processes, cleaning up the data and making it ready for us to present it. And we do this through um, sharing the information through uh, PowerPoint presentations, which have narrations, or we do it through our BI portals. Uh, we do this through um, the different types of BI portals that we have. We have two systems, the Power Heater and Tableau system that we disseminate information for easy access for the faculties and the lecturers to look at. Um, and then we also um, allow for feedback from the users to tell us what can we improve from those processes and also from the engagement that we have through student success committee members uh, committee meetings that we have on a bi-monthly basis, all through the, the bi-weekly um, meetings that we have with the, CIP, uh, with the data analytics working group, we are able to identify that. And this process is an iterative process because it's ongoing. As we reflect on the information that we shared, we go back and refine until we find the right solution for our data. And I'm going to hand over to Bradley to show you some of the information we are doing. All right, um, good morning, um, everyone. So Ronald Koff, um, an economist once stated, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. And so as part of the analysis that we did, we thought to further interrogate our data and we developed um, various um, um, analysis. We embarked on a module pass rates analysis, which you can see on the one side of the screen um, as an example, where we developed various dashboard and I mean dashboards and obtained various insights. Our analysis included module pass rates per faculty entrance attributes of um, our students, where the data was viewed by ethnicity, by gender, by APS scores, um, by school quintiles, nationality, um, you name it. We looked at academic attributes analysis where we considered student pass rates, um, again, using similar groupings um, 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 and in other different groups as well. We also considered um, differences between different groups of people, different modules, different departments and faculties in terms of pass rates and trends um, over time. We can go to the next slide. Um, and as we were doing that um, um, analysis of the module pass rates, we then um, further asked ourselves some questions. Which programs were most affected by the high priority modules that were identified? What were the retention rates within these programs? And if maybe there are specific personas, um, can we identify the specific personas with the lowest retention rates? 
And so we identified one of the arts faculty problem, uh, programs as one of the most affected by our high priority modules. Now, the arts faculty second year retention rate as a whole was 71.5% for the 2015 cohort, improving to about 80.9% for the 2020 cohort. Within this identified program, um, the second year retention rate was 80.3% for the 2015 cohort, improving to 88.4% for the 2020 cohort. Now, further interrogation of this program then revealed that Black African males from school quintiles one, two, and three were the least retained persona, um, even though there had been significant improvements in retentions between the 2015 and 2020 cohorts. Now, what you look at or what you can see there is a comparison between the males and the females, and yes, the improvement is on both sides, um, but the males were still um, lagging behind. So we can move to the next slide. We then interrogated our students' pre-entry attributes to understand some of the anticipations and maybe some of the support that's needed as they come into the university. We considered a pre-entry student's attribute and expectations survey, which found that between 2019 and 2021, there was an increase um, in first year students who felt overwhelmed by personal problems um, during their final year of high school. Um, in actual fact, you're looking at about 48% um, students who felt overwhelmed by personal problems at least twice a week in their final year of high school, that's for 2020, and that increased to 55%. Next slide. Um, furthermore, 59% of the 2020 cohort felt overwhelmed by schoolwork at least twice a week during their final year of high school, increasing to 70% uh, feeling overwhelmed at least twice a week. And maybe COVID in part um, explains that. Now, the BUSI survey further enabled us to unpack our students' attributes and highlight possible areas of support. And excluding the nows, when no response was, was, was offered, we see that 79% of students anticipated that their subject material would be moderately difficult and an additional 16% um, anticipated that it would be very difficult. So in total, 95% come with the anticipation that their material would be difficult. In total, 85% of students anticipated some difficulty in managing their time. 85% anticipated um, difficulty in getting help with academic support, and 83% um, of students in total anticipated some form of difficulty in their interactions with staff. And so the academic attributes highlighted the student performance, the surveys gave us a, win a window into their attributes and expectations and the insight obtained then provided an opportunity for us to better support our students. Um, Prof. Pata, you may go ahead. Thank you, Bradley. So colleagues, firstly, I want to thank uh, the last three presenters. Vanessa is the director of the Academic Planning Unit and her team worked on looking at the retention throughput rate and academic uh, uh, performance over those years. And then Elizabeth and uh, Bradley are in the business uh, intelligence unit. And both of them also looked at all the other data to try and support uh, uh, the uh, information that uh, Vanessa's unit had brought in. So as you can see, we had different sources of data from across the institution, all coming in together to look at the high priority modules. So when this information was collected, we sat as a team, the uh, Sia Pumalela working team, working group, sat together to look at how best or how could we support this high priority modules more holistically, looking at the data that we collected especially with the students coming into campus with certain kind of stresses and then being placed or being in this uh, identified high priority module, what additional stresses would they have? 
So we, we planned, and this is looking at uh, uh, how do we move forward now? How do we look at providing holistic support? And the four areas that we looked at is uh, curriculum support for the high priority modules, looking specifically at uh, what is the curriculum or what's in that content in the high priority modules that, that uh, is put out, uh, the deliverables, how do they deliver that content, what are the assessment tasks that is done, how are those assessment tasks broken, broken down, uh, identifying the threshold concepts within that module and trying to support uh, um, uh, the lecturer in that way. And then looking at the tutorial program. How can the tutorial program further support those high priority modules? Looking at supporting the lecturer, supporting the tutor, and also providing uh, workshops for the tutors on how do you uh, go, uh, how do you then uh, uh, transfer knowledge to the students, especially those uh, uh, threshold concepts? How do you unpack them? and how do you break it down and support the students in the tutorial classroom. Then looking at the student well-being support, uh, looking specifically at the students in the first year high priority modules. How do we support them holistically? They would be struggling with stresses during that time. So it's bringing in that uh, um, student well-being uh, uh, and mental health support to students. But more specifically, we wanted to provide training for the mentors in the mentorship program so that they could deal with the students and the stresses that they had. So it's also not only looking at the students, but looking at the mentors who support those students. And lastly, how do we support the lecturers? Uh, the direct, Directorate of Learning, Teaching and Student Success Unit providing workshops on teaching and learning techniques specifically to highlight the threshold concepts and how can we break through and uh, break it down to support those high priority modules. Uh, two systems we presently are looking at and uh, staff will be trained, academic staff together with tutors and uh, our mentors will be trained to use the system is our uh, student and uh, module tracking system and the learner case management system that will be used in this project as well. So uh, yeah, I think that's the end of our presentation. If there's any questions, we'd like to take that. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, uh, approach to looking at um, students in, in a more holistic way in these sometimes very difficult courses. We know that some maths can always be the one that does, but one of the interesting things I think we heard two or three years ago from Pretoria is they analyzed which of the um, uh, content parts of the mathematics one were not performing and they found that there was one module that was causing some problem so they moved to the second here and guess what all the students started performing better so it and it's they did this with data so data becomes very important and it's interesting to see how you have integrated all kinds of people in that data chain that you expressed. So are there any other questions that I see, Elizabeth, you have answered a long question. Would you like to perhaps just talk to everybody about that? Um, it was Vanessa, and I think Vanessa has left the meeting. Um, I'm still here, I'm still here Elizabeth. <laughs> okay, you can expand on that, Vanessa. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I think the question was really around um, tracking what's happening with student performance uh, pre-COVID, during COVID and afterwards and trying to figure out what's actually going on. And, uh, you know, the comment I'm trying to make is that we need to understand what these shifts are in student performance. I think 
in our institution when we presented the data, there was sort of one group of people was judging to say our assessments are not up to standard. And then there was another group that was saying, but they are important learning and teaching innovations that happened during COVID when we were doing online and emergency remote, which actually enabled um, student learning, you know, things, things like asynchronous um, videos where, uh, you know, information is available for students to go back to and listen and whereas you're in contact, they have only one opportunity. So we are engaging in a research project where we're actually going, looking into the high priority modules as a start to try and understand what actually happened during 2020 um, that may have led to either these improvement or decreases and looking at the level of learning and teaching and assessment from the student's perspective as well as from the lecturers, because we want to be able to harness what, what can be opportunities. I think the world is talking about a new normal for universities. I guess what that means is we are going to approach learning and teaching and assessment in more hybrid and blended ways and more online, but we actually need to understand um, uh, you know, what the challenges are with that as, as, as well as the opportunities so, so that, that we can uh, um, attend to, to, to the implications of, for students when we make those shifts. Thank you, Vanessa. Are there any other comments that people would like to make? Well, maybe I, uh, it's interesting for this session that we always talk about student success, but every single paper that we had in this session directly spoke to how do we support students from the technology of uh, bots to supplementary uh, uh, in, um, instruction to helping students with their basic needs and then looking at the ways in which that um, disaggregated data can help uh, understand the barriers. So uh, this has been a nice, uh, these have been nice examples of how we put students at the center of our work. So thank you very much to all our presenters and for your hard work and for participation. And we'll see you a little later with uh, some uh, panel discussions today and some more uh, partner presentations. So thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy your break and have a good lunch. Bye-bye.